In this video, we're going to be troubleshooting a pair of CAT C15s for weak or not operational Jake brakes. What are we going to find on each one? Well, it varies on each engine. Also, you're going to be doing valve lash on both of these engines, and one of these engines has a bigger problem than the other, but they both have various other little problems, so let's look at them. So this first engine we're looking at, this is an Acert C15 and non-regen, it's a 04 model, but this was one of the first engines that I worked on after leaving CAT, actually. Customer had me come out to Bonner's Ferry, look at it, found that number one, in, or not number one, number four injector was misfiring. So we swapped it out and seemed like a happy customer. Well, now he's got some other stuff going on, so he wanted me to come back out and take a look at it. Just looking at various stuff here. His peanut cover is leaking all over the place. He actually said he's resealed this several times. Uh, it's an unusual place for these to leak, so I wonder what's going on there. But that's not one of the reasons why I'm out here. One of the reasons I am out here is a, he said a ticking noise coming out of the engine. Biggest cause of ticking, folks, on a lot of these, exhaust leaks. So generally, anytime you have a dark spot on or by the exhaust, that's indicative of a exhaust leak because you're gonna have carbon build up wherever the leak is. Now, a lot of times it'll burn off on the exhaust components themselves, but look around them, look on the head, look on the tubing that is not exposed to as much heat. And a lot of times you'll find the source of the leak. Now that one there on the bellows could be a problem, but doesn't mean that is the problem. However, this one on number one, yeah. That is more than likely our problem right there, folks. And uh, he said it seemed like it was an exhaust problem. Uh, so that is definitely a leak there. We'll need to resolve that. You don't wanna let these go for too long. It can eventually blow the gasket out. You can break the studs off in the head, no good. So what we're doing here is we're just verifying to see what the heck's going on. Is it? actually sound like it's leaking I don't really hear it too horribly bad but it's uh, it I mean it definitely does have an exhaust leak there I don't hear anything else weird though with the engine I don't hear any ticking or anything that I would really be concerned of but I should probably pull the valve covers and take a look and probably run it so what I do here is I found a lot of dirt and dead bugs and stuff get built up between the valve covers. so the best thing to do is take your brake clean can or compressed air and blow out between the valve covers. That'll usually dislodge and get rid of most of that debris. Because if you don't, when you pull the valve cover, it's just gonna fall right into the engine. And I don't know about you, but I generally try to keep dead bugs and dirt out of the engine. It's always those couple bolts you can't get to with one socket. You always end up having to use a wrench or a wobbly socket. And it's usually the front two where the coolant tube is and usually some in the back because of the coolant overflow. Of course, every engine's different, but just kind of stuff you get used to as a mechanic, folks. So pulling the center one off first. I generally have found if you pull the center one off first, it's not only the easiest to remove, but it also helps getting the forward and rear one off a lot easier because if you have to wiggle them or reposition them, the center one is not blocking your way. And normally you have to pull them towards the center to remove the front and rear ones. So looking at this engine here, and I've noticed this on most of the A-certs I've been working on lately, the IVAs are disconnected. They're bypassed, and I understand IVAs are a problem-prone system. I do not bypass them myself. I don't do any sort of emission delete, but it's pretty common now to find them bypassed. So let's start this part. So what are we doing here? Well, we're just looking and listening to see if we see any other ticking or tapping or knocking. And don't see any. I mean, these engines are quite loud to begin with, but there's a normal loud and an unnormal loud. And just looking at it here, I don't see any weird movement. Oil spraying out where it's not supposed to. Broken fasteners moving around. So, you know, folks, when you watch an engine run, and this is at idle, uh, it's impressive that the air can get in and out of the cylinder with how quickly the valves open and close. I mean, look at that. Imagine that at twice the RPM. Now, this is one of the annoying things on this truck. When you go to hook up to it, uh, I don't know what the heck's going on here, but 
Frustrating! I don't know, I, someone must have done something with the dash, the retaining tab there for this guy is gone, so I'm gonna take this little pick and hold it in place so I can plug the uh, comet after in here. So what are we doing here? Well, we're hooked up to the truck and it's gonna be a little shaky here, folks. The rest of the video is not like this, just this little section here. <laughs> And I'm just checking the stages of the Jake. So we're gonna do uh, low, medium, and high and see if you can hear when they engage and when they don't. So yeah, are they working? Well, the low position, which is the center jake, is, and high is working, but you can tell that it's not on high. It's basically just the low position that's actuating. So the outer two, which is considered jake two, or medium, aren't working, and they kind of share the same solenoid. So let's take a look at that. Now, when I was out here a couple months ago, I found that the rearmost solenoid measured at two ohms. Meanwhile, the forward and middle one measured at 11 ohms. So customer went and got a new solenoid and he said, well, still doing the same thing, kind of weird. So measuring the rear one here, 39 ohms. Now, if you compare that to the other two solenoids, which are reading pretty normal, 39 is way askew. And I don't know why that's so high. It's a new solenoid. I think it is weird. The new solenoid, the connector is brown. Usually they're black. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Maybe it's a 24 volt solenoid or something's wrong but yeah i believe they either sold him the wrong one or it's a defective solenoid and he's gonna have to replace that one again as you can see the uh forward west one and the center one are both reading 11 ohms so unusual not sure what the heck's going on there but i believe that's the problem with the jakes on this one the medium position is not working because the rearmost solenoid is too much resistance and that gets us to our overhead adjustment here. Now I've got tons of videos on how to do overheads. This is not a tutorial video on how to do overheads. What I'm doing now is just getting the engine to uh, TDC here. If you're watching the, uh, this is the closest cylinder here is cylinder three. You can see I've already done some of the adjustments by the red paint marker that I've got here. And folks, I do a lot of overheads. I Some I do. I've done several of before, obviously, before leaving CAT, but almost every customer that reaches out wants me to do an overhead adjustment, which is kind of weird to me. I would think I'd be more useful troubleshooting, which I have been used for, but uh, it seems like overheads, which are, you know, they're very important maintenance item. Most people are not comfortable doing them themselves. But I think it, it kind of highlights a big problem in the industry in that people are happy to do the maintenance on their engines, but a lot of times the dealership or the company doesn't make it easy for them. Uh, as a lot of customers will say, yeah, I could take it to Peterbilt, but it'll sit there for two or three weeks before they do the valve adjustment. That's a real problem. Obviously, this is their business vehicle. Not only that, they have a lot of stuff in their vehicle, usually tools, personal stuff, and if you go drop it off, a lot of times they're gonna have to empty that out and then their truck's down for a while waiting to get this adjustment done. And also you don't know the caliber of the person that's gonna do the overhead, whereas if you hire me, you at least know what you're getting and I come to you. So I think that's one of the reasons why I've been doing so many overheads. People just, they want them done, they want them done correctly, they don't want the hassle of having to take it and drop it off, where I just come out and do it on site. So that's probably, that's my theory, could be wrong, but as you can see, this obviously sped up. I do not do the overhead uh, quite this quick, although that'd be pretty cheap overhead because I bill by the hour, but yeah, we're doing here, we are doing the uh, intake valves, exhaust valves. Uh, these, the IVAs are obviously, uh, well, we're not gonna be adjusting those obviously because someone has bypassed that system. Still have to do the Jake settings. His overhead was actually pretty close. He didn't need an overhead per se. Uh, most of the settings, I could get the fueler gauge in there without really any hassle. A few of them did need like this exhaust valve here on uh, number two. Did have to adjust that one, but I'd say about half the valves and the uh, injector heights were fine. I didn't have to adjust them at all. 
And I used to loosen everything and just adjust everything, but anymore I like to get the initial readings to just see where it is, if, it's, if they're all super tight or super loose, at least you can notify the customer and say, hey look, these really did need adjusted or didn't really need adjusted at all. So just normal overhead adjustment, something that I have done a lot of lately. So let's have a little destruction of the week. This week's instruction of the week comes from Bailey into C13 Lifter. Oh boy, look at the flat spot on that. Hello. Hello. That sucker was super shot. And what do we got here? Well, this is a Mac transmission sent from Jerry, and uh, I didn't even know Mac made automatic transmission. This one broke the bell housing, though, so that one's going to be getting a new one. This one's from Jeffrey, and it's got a new piece here in the engine. It's uh, John Deere. Kind of an unusual piece, not sure what that is. It looks like a wrist pin, not sure why it's coming out of the side. Got basically an entire rebuild kit here in the oil pan, so that's very convenient. Thank you to John Deere for uh, including all these extra parts in the oil pan there. Yeah, I think that's what they found in the oil pan. <laughs> Look at the rod bearings, oh my gosh. Uh, pretty good compilation of uh, some destruction there. So this is our kind of a stopping point on this puppy for now. We did the Jake's, found the ticking, and did the overhead. Let's look at this one, another C15. Now, this is a 6NZ C15. So, single turbo. That's not a retrofitted single turbo, but he's got weak Jake's and needs an overhead done. Noticing a common theme here, folks? So, before doing the overhead, let's look at why the Jake's might be weak first. All right, folks, so pull the valve covers nothing is obvious as far as don't see anything broken but one thing I did notice right away and an observant person will notice this is 340c model right 340c 340b 340B. So he's got mismatched Jake housings, which pretty sure you're not supposed to have that. I'm not sure why he's got a B, a B, and a C here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to plug in and see what our serial number is because I don't see the tag. But with the mismatch there, that's going to create a problem. Usually they have different settings for the latch, for one thing. Um, but I'm wondering also if, I don't know if the solenoids are different. That could be causing some sort of electrical fault. So Let's, uh, let's get plugged in and see what's going on. So one thing I always want to check is that the ECM is seeing Jake signal. Is it seeing low, medium, and high? We're on low right now. You can see it there on the bottom line. It's going to go to medium. It does. It's going to high. Yep. So ECM is seeing the signal. That's good. Let's uh, run this puppy and see what the heck's going on. So just like the other engine here, although you can really get a better viewpoint on this one where it doesn't have the oil bridges to the IVAs. This one doesn't have IVAs at all, by the way. But just like the other one, looking for big oil leaks, cracked housings, anything that looks weird compared to the other ones. And yeah, that's I found lots of weird stuff over the years just by running the engines with the valve covers off. And yeah, sometimes you'll see stuff that you would never seen by running it and trying to figure it out without that. But yeah, don't see anything. And the condition of the engine looks really good, really clean, no signs of moisture or anything in it. So we need to, uh, not really sure what's going on. No codes for the Jakes either. So we're gonna have to do some other settings. Now, one thing I did notice when I was plugged in, the atmospheric pressure or barometric pressure sensor was showing a voltage low code, which is a short, and I checked and it looked, when I unplugged it, it said oil pressure voltage high. So yeah, the oil pressure and barometric pressure were backwards. So I swapped those, now it is no longer showing those codes. I don't think that has anything to do with the Jakes. Might have had some performance complaints he was unaware of. But yeah, so what we're going to do now is use our trusty little screwdriver here and actuate the Jake solenoids manually. Look at that. 
No, you could do that? Yeah, basically it will force them on. Yeah, and you can hear it kind of kill those two cylinders and squirts oil all over the place. That is normal, so they are actuating. So 33 thousandths, according to the uh, information I have there, is the setting for the lash on 340B or a 340C. 33 thousandths on either one. So what is it at? Uh, the valve lash on the Jakes is very important. If it's too loose or too tight, you're changing when they engage and it basically changes the profile of how the Jake operates quite a bit. And if you can't tell, these ones are super loose. The uh, 340B housings here, yeah, they're way loose, almost like they're set to closer to 40. And this, the 340C, oh my goodness, you could probably get two 33,000 feeler gauges in there. That one is super loose, so it might be the problem in itself is just the valve lashes off. So we're gonna go ahead and do our adjustment. So we did our adjustment on that puppy. Start it up, make sure it runs still. I gotta put the valve covers intake tubing back on this one. Still waiting to hear on the customer and whether the Jakes are working better. Uh, he needs to do it under load to see. This one we're gonna be doing the exhaust manifold hopefully this week. I try to get a video on that. And uh, so this will be a to be continued section. Thanks for watching.